Hello and welcome to Caesar Algebras from a Novice Perspective. Today I want to talk about non-examples and let's begin by reviewing the basic definitions of the Caesar Algebra. So first we have this concept of the Banach Algebra, which is a complex algebra which has some norm and the algebra should be complete with respect to the norm and finally this norm should satisfy this Banach inequality that the norm of A times B is less than or equal to the norm of A times the norm of B. And this property here is sometimes called the submultiplicative property, but I'm just going to say the Banach property going forward. And then we have star algebras, which are algebras which have a unary operator star, which we call the star operator, of course. And the star operator should be an involution, meaning that it's its own inverse. And it should be conjugate linear, and it, as it is here. And we have that this lambda is a complex number. And finally, it should be an anti-homomorphism, meaning that it reverses the order of multiplication. So the star of A times B is equal to the star of B times the star of A. And once we have a Banach star algebra, we can talk about the C star condition. So a C star condition is the following, that the norm of a star times a should be equal to the norm of a squared. And when we have a Banach star algebra whose norm satisfies this condition, then we have a C star algebra. And as I said in the previous lecture, this C star condition might at first glance seem a bit uh, simplistic and innocent, but the fact is it's quite a strong one and it has several important implications. So the central topic of this lecture will be to explore some examples of Banach star algebras that are not C star algebras. And to begin this, I want to discuss one immediate consequence of the C star condition just to show the immediate strength of it. And that is that if we have a C star algebra, then the C star condition implies the following, that the norm of a squared is equal to the norm of a star times a, and then we have this sub-multiplicative property. So this is less than or equal to the norm of a star times the norm of a, which is in turn implies that the norm of a is less than or equal to the norm of a star. But we can play this game for a star as well, and we get in an analogous way that the norm of a star is less than or equal to the norm of a. In other words, the C star condition immediately implies that the star operator is in fact an isometry. So let's look at some examples where this is not the case. And the first non-example I want to take up is actually that of matrix algebras. So from the last lecture, we looked at the algebra of complex n by n matrices, which we denote by this. And this is in C star algebra when we give the star operator as Hermitian conjugation, which we denote by this dagger symbol here. And we have the norm to be the operator norm induced by the Hilbert norm on CN. So this induced operator norm is the supremum norm taken here. So this operator norm that we have here is actually a Banach norm regardless of which norm we choose on CN. So this can be proven pretty easily by noting that the norm of A times B is just this supremum over here. But this is of course less than or equal to the operator norm of A times the supremum of BX over here. But by definition, this supremum is just the norm of B. So we get this submultiplicative property pretty easily, meaning that this norm is a Banach norm no matter what. As long as it's an induced operator norm, it doesn't really matter what norm we pick on CN. But the fact is that only the Hilbert norm on CN makes this algebra of matrices into a C star algebra. And we don't have the tools necessary yet to really explain why this is the case, although we might get back to it later on. But let's just look at an example or two of norms on CN, which do not yield a, a C star algebra. Excuse me. So 
First, we consider the one norm and the infinity norm on Cn, which are given by the following. So the norm of x with the one here is just the sum of the absolute values of the components of x. And the infinity norm of x is just the maximum absolute value of any of the components of x. And when we look at the induced operator norms we get on the matrix algebra from these, we get that the one norm is just the maximum absolute column sum of the matrix A, and that the infinity norm of A is equal to the maximum absolute row sum of A. And from this, it's pretty easy to see that the one norm of a matrix A is equal to the infinity norm of its Hermitian conjugate. And thus, if we pick any matrix A such that the one norm of A is not equal to the infinity norm of A, which is equal to the one norm of A dagger, then we see immediately that this dagger is not even an isometry. And thus, neither the one norm nor the infinity norms norm are C star norms. But let's uh, consider some other kinds of non-examples. So in this last example, um, the C star condition fail, fails because the star operator was not even an isometry. But what about the cases where it is? Are there any non C star box star algebras where the star operator is an isometry? The answer to this question is yes, of course there are. In fact, there are many of them. And let us first look at the disk algebra. So here we denote by D the open unit disk in the complex plane, and we let A of D be the algebra of continuous functions on the closure of D, which are holomorphic or analytic on the open disk. And then we let the norm just be the supremum norm, as usual, really for function algebras. And then we let the star operator be the following involution. So the star of F evaluated at Z is equal to the complex conjugate of F evaluated at the, the complex conjugate of Z. And it's pretty easy to check that this is actually an isometric involution. And from this, we can see that AD here is a Banach star algebra. But this is not a C star algebra because the C star property is not satisfied. And this is easiest to observe by the following example. So we just take some function f and we pick this one in particular, that f of z equals z minus, well, minus i, which yields that the star of f is just equal to z plus i. And therefore we get f star times f evaluated at z is equal to this function here, z squared plus one. And thus we get that the norm of f squared, which is two squared, which is equal to four, is not equal to two, which is the norm of f star f. And from this, we see immediately the C star condition fails, and we have not a C star algebra. However, note the following, that if we take a function g to be the identity function, then this is a self-adjoint element of the algebra, and it has the spectrum, which is the whole unit disk, or even the closure of the whole unit disk, which is not a subset of the real line. This property actually proves that the disk algebra is not a Caesar algebra, as we will see later on. But right now, we will have to stick with this more basic example with F to really prove that the siege star condition fails. But really, when we are further along in the course, we will see that this identity function is another way of proving that A of D is not a C star algebra. But 
this is also kind of an example where we chose an involution on purpose to make this seesaw condition fail. But let's look at another example. So here we take L1 of Z. And this is just the set of absolutely convergent sequences over uh, the whole numbers. And we take the multiplication to be given from convolution. So F times G in the convolution sense is equal to this sum over here. This infinite series, maybe we should say. And it's pretty easy to show that this is actually a commutative product. So F times G is actually equal to G times F here, which is pretty neat, pretty neat fact. So this is actually a commutative algebra in general. And the norm we take to be the one norm, which is simply the absolute sum, basically. So we just take whatever this series converges to in the absolute sense. Pretty simple. And since we know that the these series are always going to be absolutely convergent, then there is absolutely no problem taking this norm. And furthermore, let's just quickly note that with this convolution product in place, and with this norm, we get that the norm of f times g is less than or equal to the norm of f times the supremum of g over all the indexes i. And this supremum of g, this is of course less than or equal to the norm of g. So we immediately get that this norm here satisfies the Banach property. And finally, we pick the star operator to be f star of i e is equal to the complex conjugate of f evaluated at minus i, as we have here. And with this, L1 of z is a Banach star algebra, and the star operator is an isometry, which is pretty easy to verify. However, L1 of z is not a Caesar algebra. And this can once again be seen most easily by taking a concrete element of L1. And we take this particular f in L1, which is f naught or f of 0 is equal to 1, f of 1 is equal to f of 2, which is equal to minus 1, and finally, f of i is equal to zero for any other i. Then we can just calculate f star times f at each index i, and we see that f star times f is equal to three if i equals zero, is equal to minus one if i equals either plus or minus two, and f star times f or any other on evaluated at any other index is just equal to zero. And therefore we pretty easily see that the norm of f star times f is equal to 5. But the norm of f squared is equal to 9. And therefore, the c star condition fails. However, this example is actually of particular interest to us, because this is actually not a counterexample because of how we chose the norm or how we chose the star operator there is actually no way to make L1 of Z into a Caesar algebra. And as we shall see a bit later on, this has to do with the, this algebra being com unital and commutative. But we won't go into detail quite yet why that is the case. But maybe we'll return to this example once we have the machinery necessary to prove that there is no way to make L1 into a Caesar algebra. But let's just recap what we've learned in this short lecture. So first off, we have that the C star condition is far from trivial. And there are several examples of Banach star algebras that are not C star. And secondly, sometimes the C star condition fails because of how the norm is chosen. And that is something we saw in the matrix example. And equally valid is the case where the C star condition fails because of how the star operator is chosen, which is something we saw in the disk algebra example. But then we have cases like L1 of Z, where there is no way to make 
a complex algebra into a Caesar algebra, no matter how we try to choose the norm and the star operator. It simply doesn't matter. And that's basically what I wanted to convey with this lecture, that the C star condition is far from trivial. And although many examples that we know that are Banach star algebras just happen to be C star algebras as well, but there are many other examples of Banach star algebras which do not satisfy the C star property. And it's important to know that because otherwise you might, might get this feeling that the C star condition is actually not that serious. But as we shall see, it is a big deal, deal, and it enables us to get a lot of structure out, out of general C star algebras, and we can do a lot of interesting stuff with them. And that is why the, the theory of C star algebras is so rich, because the C star condition actually brings a lot of structure to the algebra, which might seem a bit surprising at first glance. So that's it for now. And let's see what the next lecture entails.